Welcome to another People's Church Church at Home service. We are so glad that you could join us today. A very special welcome to each and every person who is here with us for the very first time. We are so glad to have you. My name is Montli Tele and together with my wife who will be sharing God's word with us this morning. We get the incredible honor and privilege of pastoring People's Church. In John chapter 4, we get an, a very incredible conversation where Jesus talks to a woman from Samaria. And in verse 21, this is what it says. Jesus replied to the woman and he said, Believe me, dear woman. The time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. It's very interesting because we are all living in such a time. Worshiping God is no longer bound to a physical location. So let me encourage you to engage with the service. To not just be a spectator but to participate in the service. Don't be passive. Be active, respond, shout amen, stand to your feet if you need to. Because the presence of God is not only here, but it is also right there with you wherever you are. So be part of the service. And before we go any further, let us just prepare our hearts by praying. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for yet another day. We thank you for this beautiful day that you have given to us, Father God. And we pray, Lord God, for everything, Father, that's about to be said into our lives, that's about to be spoken, Father God, uh, by your children into our lives. We pray that you use it, Father. We pray that you help us to open our hearts, to open our minds, to be able to receive the word that is going to be preached into our lives. Father, we pray that the word might find a place in our hearts, Father, that it may grow, that it may transform us, that it may change us, Father God. We pray indeed that we may not only be hearers of the word, but also doers of the word, because those are the kind of people that you are looking for. Father, we thank you so much. We give you all the honor and all the glory in Jesus Christ's mighty name, now and forevermore. Amen. Good morning, family. It's a privilege to be in your living rooms once again, and this time to bring you the offering message. A word of encouragement, I believe, in the season that we are in. There is a line in the Lord's Prayer that says, Give us our daily bread. Now, bread in the Lord's Prayer refers to both food, physical, and spiritual. It's easy for some of us to believe that God is interested in our spiritual nourishment. But it's a bit more difficult to be convinced that God is interested in our physical nourishment. Now, this line in the Lord's Prayer tells me that our physical nourishment matters to God. We read in Matthew 6, 11, Give us this day our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. Meaning God knows that this is a daily thing and it is something that we need to come to him for daily. When I read in this scripture, I was reminded that God cares and God in fact wants to give us our daily bread. I was also reminded in the story of Elisha in the recent week as I was reading the word of God that when there was a severe drought, God told Elisha to go and hide by the brook of Cherith. God knew that Elisha is going to need food and God had already prepared ravens to feed Elisha by the brook of Cherith. Now God had prepared Elisha's, Elisha's meals before Elisha even knew he would need to eat. Now when the brook dried up, God sent Elisha to Zarephath, where God had already provided through a widow. There are three points that I would like us to take with us this morning. The first one is God is prepared to meet your needs before you even start to recognize that you are in need. God did not act surprised that, oh, Elisha, now you need food. Okay, what can we do? No, the meals were already prepared in advance. The second point is God's ways of providing will not always make human logical sense. God used ravens. Why not an angel? God could have easily sent an angel. God used a widow. Why not a rich person? You see, sometimes we are tempted to think that our salaries is what will put food on our table. Sometimes we are tempted to believe that our relatives or our closest friends are the ones who will meet our needs. But God, in fact, has a way of using the weirdest ideas to put a meal on our table. The third point is, you will never die in the drought. After the widow obeyed Elisha, God made sure that they did not run out of food until the rain 
returned. God promised that you will not run out of food until the rain returned. And it's the same promise that he is given to us this morning. In our current season of economic drought, we will find safety, spiritual safety, in the rock of all ages, which is our God. We will drink from the living waters and feed on Jesus, the bread of life. But that is your spiritual nourishment. When it comes to your physical nourishment, we will need to trust God to meet our physical needs supernaturally. We need to trust God to send the ravens to feed us and also give us hearts like the widow to trust his promises of provision. This morning, as we are prepared to give to God's work, whether you find yourself hiding like Elisha, desperately hoping for God to come through for you, or as the widow, where it seems like you, ha you are having to give of your last, the very little you still have, you still have to stretch it beyond yourself. I pray that you will trust in the fact that God will meet you at your point of needs. And I pray for abundance in your families and in your life in Jesus' name. I also pray 1 Kings 17 verse 14 upon you today. It reads as follows. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. I want to thank you this morning for your eagerness to give to God's work. Because of you, some of God's children are being fed. Because of you, God's work can go on. Let us pray. Father, thank you that we get an opportunity to give to your work. We thank you that we can trust in the fact that you have prepared our meals for days ahead of us. Father, we trust you this morning to go ahead and do what you need to do in our lives. Help us to trust you to also give, Lord Jesus, from what you have already given to us. We thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. I would like to hand over to Pastor Kulutele for the word of God. God bless you. Good morning, church. It's always an honor and a privilege to share the word of God with you. And I do hope and trust that everyone is doing well this morning. Today marks exactly 10 weeks. Can you believe it? 10 Sundays since we last gathered together physically. It's just over two months now. Interesting, isn't it? I bet no one has ever thought that they could go for 10 Sundays without gathering in a church building in their Christian journey. But this is where we are at now. This has become our new normal. But look at you. You are doing so well, regardless. You're praying, you're still reading the word, you still get to listen to the sermon at the comfort of your home. So it's not that, it's not that bad, really. The gathering aspect hasn't stopped entirely. Physically, yes, it has, but we are still gathering virtually, and that is good enough for now. So today I want to speak under the title, Life Interrupted. And I am certain that you can relate to what I just said. Not necessarily because of what's happening now, although it may be the case for others, but simply because life interruptions happen every day to each one of us in different forms. It may be big or small, but every one of us at some point in life, we do experience an interruption. A lot of people's lives in the Bible were actually interrupted. But today, I wanna take you through one person's life whom I think we can learn a lot from. His life is truly inspiring. And I know you might have heard the story of this person before. This is Joseph. I know you might have heard the story of Joseph before a lot of times, 
But I would like to encourage you to listen with a different perspective today, to listen afresh this morning. So now Joseph, as, as I had already introduced him, had a dream. And when he had this dream, he told his brothers. And the Bible tells us that after telling his brothers, they hated him even more. It doesn't say that they hated him. It says even more because there was a hate that already existed before he told them about the dream. And that's because he was his father's favorite. They already hated him for that. So now when he was bringing this dream, the dream that insinuated that he, his family was going to be dependent upon him, that he, they were going to have to bow down before him, they were not happy with that. The brothers were not happy, and even the father was not happy about that dream. So when a 17-year-old Joseph had a dream, and he innocently shared it with his brothers, like anyone else would, but after narrating this dream to his brothers, his life took a rather unexpected turn. A turn that seemed like an interruption from the dream he had. Now, if you read from Genesis 37, a number of things happen in Joseph's life. Firstly, his brothers betrayed him by selling him to the Ishmaelites. And during the time they sold him, Slaves were in very great demand, so he became a slave in Egypt. Another thing that happened amongst a lot of things that happened in, in his life is that he spent his youth years in prison. But every time all these things happened, we see God's hand. We see God's favor so vividly upon his life. Everywhere he went, he had favor, even amid the interruptions. When his brothers betrayed him, he had favor with Reuben, who was his oldest brother, who saved his life. He also had favor with Potiphar. And we read in Genesis 39 verse 4 that Joseph found favor in Potiphar's sight and served him. Then Potiphar made Joseph overseer of his house and all that he had put under his authority. Again, he also had favor with the prison keeper. And we read in verse 21 in the same chapter that, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. And he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. The one thing that keeps on being reiterated over and over upon Joseph's life is that the Lord was with him. Now this morning, I'd like us to go through three things that will help us navigate through life's interruptions. And the first one is that we should embrace the interruptions. We should embrace them, why? Because interruptions do not stop God from accomplishing his promises in our lives. And we see this very clearly in Joseph's life. But I can imagine, I can imagine that during his time in Egypt as a slave, he constantly asked himself if this dream was a joke, if the dream will even come to fruition, even with him being a slave in Egypt. Because in his mind, what was happening now looks nothing like the dream he had, looks nothing like the dream he had where his family will be dependent on him where they will bow before him. Now it almost looks like the dream is an envious because Joseph finds himself in a place where he is dependent on someone else, where he is bowing before someone else. But this morning, I want to remind you that the promises, the visions, the dreams, and the prophecies, whatever channel God spoke to you in, the plans, the ideas, they are still valid. God will bring them to fruition and completion. We read in James chapter 1 from verse 2 to 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Patience 
is defined as the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, problems or suffering without being annoyed or anxious. And James is telling us that we need to let that patience, together, what, together with what it comes with, endurance and perseverance, we need to let that, the capacity to accept or tolerate delays, problems or suffering without becoming annoyed or anxious. We need to let that have, it, have its perfect work in us so that we may be complete and lacking of nothing. In other versions it says, so that we may be mature and lacking of nothing. Because patience develops us in our Christian attributes. It's almost like a form of preparation for what is still to come. And just because there was an interruption, it doesn't mean that God stops. No, he doesn't. Things might have paused, but God is still working. He is using this time to do something within us so that we may be perfect and complete, not lacking anything. And this is because he cares about us. He wants us to be in that state, the state of completion. The second point is that we need to observe, or rather we need to watch our attitudes. How we respond to the things that happen in our lives matters. It really, really matters. Sometimes we don't have control over what happens in our lives, but we can choose to, we can choose to control how we respond. The responding part is up to you and I. And from the life of Joseph, we can see that he actually embraced his situation. He really did. And that is evident even in, in his attitude throughout his time in Egypt as a slave. Joseph served with so much excellence and the favor of God was upon him. So much, so much that even his master could see that there was something different about this particular slave. He could see that the Lord was with him. He could see that the favor of God was upon him. And we read in Proverbs 9 verse 10 that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Joseph feared God and we see this with what happened with Potiphar's wife. Potiphar's wife had longing eyes for Joseph, as the Bible actually describes it, and she wanted him to lie with her. So when, when she found an opportunity or, well, or when she found a moment where it was just her and Joseph in the house, this is what actually happened. That she caught him, which is Joseph, by his garment, saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. Considering everything that Joseph had been through, this was such an opportune moment for him to just do as he likes. I mean, no one was there. It was literally just the two of them. He could have done anything. But he did not let that moment weaken him. He did not give in to the temptation. He did, not say, he did not say, no one sees me. It doesn't matter. Because God always sees. In Matthew 6 verse 6, it says that your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Whatever your life interruption is at the moment, no matter how big or small it is, do not let it take you out of the faith. Or don't let it make you do things that are outside what you believe in. Really, in moments like this, our attitude can either be positive or negative. We can either choose to look at the bigger picture or do as we please. The third and the last point is that we need to get ready for a new thing. We need to anticipate a new thing in our lives. In Isaiah 43, God spoke to prophet Isaiah regarding the Israelite situation. So this chapter talks about the promised deliverance of the Israelites from Babylon. And in, in Isaiah 43 from verse 18 to 19, it reads like this. 
Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So God here is telling the nation of Israel that he is making a new thing, that he is making a way through the wilderness. Now I want to take you back to Exodus 14. In Exodus 14, God parted the Red Sea for the children of Israel to go through. We are told that the waters were like a wall on the left and the right side when he parted them, that it was solid, it was frozen. It was such a divine miracle, no doubt about that. But this time around, Isaiah is saying, God will not make a way through parting the Red Sea, through parting the waters. He will make a way in the wilderness. And that's how God operates. He is always doing a new thing. Now the former deliverance of Israelites out of Egypt was glorious. It was divine. It was majestic. But it cannot be compared to what's still to come. So the past miracles would be nothing in compared to what he is about to do because he is always doing a new thing. I like the scripture in Haggai 2 verse 9. It says, the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. We cannot afford to think that our best days that our best revelations, miracles are behind us because the best is yet to come. He may have done it before and you thought this was it. But I want to remind you that your best is not behind you, but rather it is before you. There's a song that I like. It says, faithful you have been and faithful you will be because whether it be yesterday or today, his faithfulness still stands. We often like saying, you know, back in the days, I used to be a prayer warrior. I worked hard. I spent more time with God. God did more in my life then than now. But could it be that we expect God to do things exactly the same way he did before? Could it be that he is doing a new thing, but because we are still holding on to what he did, before that we can't see this new thing. Now don't get me wrong, our moments of victories, our moments of answered prayers, they help us to hold on. They really do. They help us to, to look back and see God's faithfulness. But let us not hold on, on to them so much that we can't even see the new thing that he is doing in our lives. When Jesus performed miracles and wonders, he did them differently from person to person. Even when he was healing the blind, he did it differently every time. And I believe there is a reason for that. Why? Because behold, he is doing a new thing. And I feel like he's saying, I will do a new thing. He's, he's saying, behold, be amazed, be in awe as you watch me do this new thing. I believe that Joseph had so many behold moments with God. When his brothers betrayed him and he thought, that's it, I'm going to die here. God said, behold, I am doing a new thing. And just when he was grateful to just be alive, even if it means him being a slave, God said, behold, I am doing a new thing. And then he found favor with Potiphar. And just when he thought, this is it, this definitely has to be it. I was supposed to be dead, but I'm not. Instead, I'm, an, I'm Potiphar's overseer in the house. This is it, Lord, I'm grateful. But God said, behold, I am doing a new thing. As if all of that was not enough. God said, behold. Behold, Joseph, I am doing a new thing. He had favor with the prison keeper. 
Listen, he's doing a new thing. He desires to do that in every aspect of our lives. From our businesses, relationships, to our very own spirituality. God used Joseph to save Israel from a time of famine. And every part of his journey was frustrating. It was unclear, but God's mercies were new in his life each and every day. I want to end with this quote from the late Ravi Zacharias. This is from the book, The Grand Weaver. It says, so do not fear the struggle, rather embrace it. Embrace it in the knowledge that the Grand Weaver will take all of your struggles, questions, disappointments, and fears, and use them to build your faith and increasingly make you into a, a man or a woman who looks like Jesus Christ. So behold, he is doing a new thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. We thank you so much, Lord Jesus Christ, that every promise, everything that you have said regarding our lives still stand even in this very day. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you give each and every person, Lord, the hope to anticipate a new thing, Lord, a new thing that you are doing or that you're still going to do in their lives. I pray, Heavenly Father, that your name may be glorified today and forevermore. Amen. Well, we have come to the end of today's service. But don't wait until Wednesday or even next week, Sunday, to connect with us again. We would love to connect with you and keep the conversation going throughout the week. So follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Chat to us on WhatsApp, and our WhatsApp number is going to be on the screen. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and tell all of your friends and your family all about it. If you are with us for the very first time today, we would love to hear all about your experience with us. So find us and connect with us via the digital channels. And now I'd like to declare this over your life as we end this morning. It comes from Numbers chapter 6 verse 24 to 26. And this is what it says. It says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Have a great day and a blessed week ahead.